Valerie Leeds was raped after she finally died. She was beautiful. I bet it was maddening to have to wear gloves when you touched her. A note hidden in Lecter's cell. Sounds like a fan letter might have been mailed by the Tooth Fairy. He wants Lecter's approval. He's curious about you. He's asking questions. I've already scrambled a chopper. Does Lecter know we have the note? Not yet. It was found during a routine cleanup. They don't open his mail? Can't. Need a warrant. X-rays only. The note's on two pieces of toilet paper, but we didn't find it all. A middle part seems to have been torn out by Lecter. It's missing. Where's Lecter now? Still in the holding cage. Can he see himself from there? No. But he's already been there almost half an hour. Pretty soon he'll start to wonder what's wrong. We gotta buy time, Jack. This is a psychological thriller. My dear Dr. Lecter, I wanted to tell you I'm delighted that you've taken an interest in me. I don't believe you tell them who I am. The important thing is what I am becoming. The tension in it is very much to do with psychological gamesmanship. This is a very shy boy, Well, Have you considered the possibility that he is disfigured, or that he may believe he is disfigured? The mythology of the story, and the mythology of the characters. I'm gonna bring it back to where it began. So you'll be wanting lots of these little chinwags, I take it. I might not have time. I do. I have oodles. Picture's off. Boom! Hey, camera mark. Be mark. Here we go! Ready! On! Action! Universal Pictures presents a remarkable cast telling the story that started it all. FBI! Francis Delahide, where is he? Red Dragon. Yeah, like that. That's great. From director Brett Ratner and Academy Award winning writer of The Silence of the Lambs, Ted Talley, comes the first and most terrifying chapter in the Hannibal Lecter trilogy. Good cut! Go behind the scenes as Anthony Hopkins reprises his Oscar-winning role. Joined by Edward Norton, Ray Fiennes, Harvey Keitel, Emily Watson, Mary Louise Parker, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Rehearsal for camera. Ready? Here we go. Let me in and stop. Action! In Red Dragon, Edward Norton plays the man who caught Hannibal Lecter, FBI profiler Will Graham, as he is lured out of retirement to catch an even more dangerous serial killer. This freak killed the Jacobis in Birmingham on Saturday night, February 25th. I think we have a better chance to catch him fast, if you help. The story is very much about how this guy who's left this work gets, gets pulled sort of step by step into exactly the kind of danger. doesn't really have a choice because it's something that he needs to do, he needs to do for himself, and that he feels a, like a moral obligation to do, and so there's, she can't really stand in his way. He went through hell and back in his first time at this job, and he kind of escaped from reality and moved down to the Florida Keys. And his boss is saying to him, you know what, get back on the horse and do this. And I understand that you don't like this, but you have a special talent, and we basically need you. 
He's got a gift for a certain sort of psychological component of the work they're doing, the profiling and things like that, and literally the ability to understand what thrill is the killer getting out of it, what is the, what's the emotional thrill for him in the crime. You took your gloves off, you touched her with your bare hand, and then you wiped her down, but when the gloves were off, did you open her eyes? The character that my character is chasing is this killer that calls himself the Red Dragon. He is obsessed with this painting by William Blake called Red Dragon. And he feels he is transforming into this red dragon, into this beast. And every time he kills a family, it's making him stronger. He doesn't like being weak. He doesn't like being vulnerable. When you play a part like this, you try to get inside the head of that person, see the world from their point of view. They're difficult scenes because they demand a kind of ra ratcheting up of in emotional intensity and, uh, and psychosis, which, you know, I'm trying to engage with something that's actually quite upsetting. I don't think anybody knows you at all, Dee. Everybody wonders about you, though, especially the women. Reba kind of is attracted to him because she sees him as a kind of a kindred spirit in some way because he has a disability. Um, you know, she knows that he's very sensitive about it. I can hear that you've had some kind of soft palate repair, but I understand you fine because you speak very well. I know what it's like to have people always thinking that you're different. The reason why Dollar Hyde falls for Reba is because of the fact that she's blind and he thinks that she's, she's not judging him. She can't see how ugly he really feels. To her, he's this shy, silent presence. I think she's trying to make him feel more relaxed and confident. The audience knows that he's something else. So she's very forward with him, very, you know, quite brazen. And uh, unfortunately for Reba, she's just been misreading all these signals. And in fact, he's a serial killer. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> It's a bit of a shame, really, when you decide to be a sexual predator and your first victim is a serial killer. Oh, he's torn. He's torn, absolutely. There's something this girl offers him that he's not... He can't articulate it to himself emotionally or rationally, but there's something about the way she engages with him that, that wrong-foots him. You do get the sense that there is some very genuine feeling there between them, and he is, he is trying to stop because of her. He's upstairs. He, he wants you, Reba. I thought he was gone, but now he's back. You really understand Francis Dollar Hyde's history. You understand his torment, his insecurities, but it's really in his head. He thinks the Red Dragon is speaking to him, so it's some scary stuff. You're hurting me! No, you can't have her! It's all over for me. I don't even have any idea who this guy is. You know, that, that stuff I just gave them was broad strokes. He's got no face to me. That's what you said about Garrett Hobbs, remember? And you figured him out. No, I didn't. You didn't? No, I was stuck on Hobbs. Yeah? I had help. Not help, but he's such a piece of intellectual machinery. He can't resist goading, needling dangling them, teasing them, but also psychoanalyzing them at the same time, trying to get into the depths of his denial. You ever seen blood in the moonlight? Well, it appears quite black. If one were nude, say, it would be better to have outdoor privacy for that sort of thing. Kai, let's go right away. It's what I really liked about where Tony went with it. I felt like he pulled Lecter back down, not only into sort of the groundedness that was in Sounds of Lambs, but even maybe even a little further into a phase of that character where, where the, the scales are still tipping back and forth between his insanity and his rationality. You say you're a layman. But it was you who caught me. Seeing Anthony Hopkins play Hannibal Lecter, it's just delicious. It's the subtle glances that he gives, or the looks, or the twitch, or the... It's just satisfying. Good morning, Will. 
So nice of you to visit again. He's an icon, you know? I mean, it's an amazing character that he's created. My philosophy as a producer, every star, every actor in the world, look for good script. You just start throwing around names. You say, God, it'd be great to have this guy. It'd be great to have that woman. It's your wish list. And because we had such a great script, it was like the wish list happened, which never happened. I think he's going to be there. Really? It's an astonishing cast. I don't think I've ever had such an impressive cast, kind of top to bottom in any movie of mine that's been made. I feel that I've got the chance to work with some really, really fine actors. And one of the great things about working with great actors is I feel they, they raise your game, you know? They throw you stuff and you have to you know, meet the challenge.